All right, well, welcome back. We'll go ahead and reconvene uh, our meeting and continue <clears throat> with item number six, review of the 2022 report outline and board discussion. And this also will be individual report out on uh, our individual subcommittees. And we'll begin with uh, our civilian uh, complaint subcommittee to start. I'm not sure who our co-chairs are for that committee. Hi, Chief Swing. This is Dominique uh, Alcaraz, one of the Deputy Attorney Generals at the Civil Rights Enforcement Section. Um, I'm going to be doing the update since the um, Civilian Complaint Subcommittee does not currently have any co-chairs, so I will uh, do that for you all. So the subcommittee met on March 30th uh, of 2021, and during that meeting, the subcommittee decided to focus on a few things um, for their section of the report over the next year. The first thing that they uh, decided to continue with is with the civilian complaint form review or the matrix of wave three and wave 3.5, which is some of the wave four agencies that are adopting or beginning to report their data early. Uh, next, they will look at creating a definition of civilian complaint that can be recommended to the legislature. Third, they will evaluate making recommendations on model civilian complaint procedures that can fill gaps in state law such as tracking complaints, uh, the definition of a civilian complaint, and communication with a complainant. And lastly, they will conduct research to gain a better understanding of what EIS systems are used throughout California and how agencies are using civilian complaints to keep officers accountable, or to keep officers and their agency accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Any questions from the board for building complaints? Okay. The next committee is the state and local racial identity profiling policies and accountability. Hi, good morning. This is um, Chair, oh, yeah, well, Subcommittee Chair, uh, Board Member Felicia Espinosa. I'm going to be reporting on um, our meeting of February 26th. Um, we met and we decided, and we are going to move forward the same with adding wave three, but also the early adopters. So there are early reporting agencies who are originally included as part of wave four um, when it comes to bias free policing policies. We will also do a wave one and two agency bias free policing policies follow up to see if those agencies of wave one and four have made any policy changes based on our reports. Um, we're also interested in Lexapol and other standard commercial policies in the future um, and how that's being used by the agencies. We're also going to explore the possibility of updating prior best practice recommendations on bias-free policing policies. In terms of our report um, for the model accountability best practices and to analyze aspects of accountability models and have chosen three subject areas to explore this. First one being supervisory oversight. Um, see, that would provide information on how agencies in terms which could be used to expand transparency and accountability. We're interested in reviewing other forms of supervisory oversight. The second um, subject area is video technology. We're interested in tech tracking those agencies that include body cam audits and supervisory review and how those and other audits are incorporated into disciplinary practices. And our third um, subject area is community-based accountability. We want to explore community-based accountability component and identifying those agencies that actually engage in community oversight for discipline, recruitment, and promotion processes, and then also um, assess the effectiveness of those civilian oversights and more, and importantly to the community's perception of that community-based accountability models uh, for those for those agencies that actually have community-based accountability models. In terms of the data-driven policy review and reforms, um, we're interested in examining data-driven strategies to implement policy reforms, addressing racial and, edit, um, racial and identity profiling. Um, we specifically talked about the disparity when it comes to transgender population we want to make sure to consider best practice recommendations to improve interactions with transgender people. Um, we will consider current policy changes 
that are happening. For example, the policy change enacted in New York um, aimed at eliminating the over-policing of transgender women. So walking while trans. Um, we also began to review the developed by the National LGBTQ and HIV Criminal Justice Working Group. We'll analyze how best practice recommendations relate to REPA data um, findings. about searches, so consent and probation. And last year's report, we also church revealed significant disparities. Um, so we want to review the disparities in we're not reviewing policies that searches. Such as data-driven six learned about last year with Hamden Connecticut Police Department. Um, all police policy consent searches. And then for probation, we would like to utilize data policies, such as those made by Oakland or San Diego Police Department who are prohibiting probation inquiries. And we'll like to take a close look at Oakland's, um, their uh, PD's policy, which prohibits inquiries into probation and parole status and limits searches for those for people on probation for nonviolent offense, unless there is reasonable suspicion that the person is engaged in criminal activity. And in looking in these strategies, we also like to um, look at Oakland PD's data to see if this actually reduced the disparities in those stops and searches. Thank you. Any questions for the uh, state and local racial identity profiling policies and accountability subcommittee? Okay, we'll move on to uh, post, post training and recruitment. It's Melody Ochoa reporting back for the post subcommittee um, on March 23rd meeting. So we had three main focuses of this meeting. First was discuss the post-certified AB 953 course that the DOJ is operating um, to ensure that law enforcement agencies, officers, um, and training personnel and executives understand how and to import um, and what information to report during RIPA stops. Um, and they'll include that information in the RIPA report. There have been multiple classes that also allow continuing professional training credits, and the DOJ has opened this up to any board members who would like to participate in these classes and get that credit, and they would love to have members of the board engaged. So if you're interested in finding out um, or in observing some or all of a class um, geared towards teaching law enforcement agencies to fill out the stop data, um, please let them know. I think. I want to say that it was Kendall who gave that presentation, who's kind of uh, in charge of that, but I'm going to volunteer Allison uh, as the contact if anyone is interested in um, following up on that, since I like to volunteer Allison. For things. No problem. I'm happy <laughs> to be, I'm happy to be the liaison. <laughs> um, and the second piece that we discussed was uh, RIPA board members reviewing of existing training courses and um, forthcoming training courses. So we reviewed the, we're continuing interacting with um, POST in their self-paced online uh, communications training course, um, the refresher course on implicit bias and racial profiling, and the, um, the uh, refresher course on implicit bias and racial profiling for supervisors as well. And what we're gonna be starting is um, reviewing of the academy courses, which has been discussed a few times. Um, here, so we're going to be, DOJ is taking a first pass to kind of tee things up for us to, to look at, but that's a very big course. Um, there's actually two courses that we're looking at. Learning Domain Number 3 is the first one, um, which is Principled Policing in the Community. And we're happy to have other committee members. We'd actually love to have as many committee members as possible looking at this, although most of the, we're going to have a point person to kind of liaise with um, posts so that they're not getting inundated with lots of different feedback, but we would love to have anyone um, take a look at a piece of this, give feedback. It'd be great to have more than one set of eyes on any particular section, just to get different perspectives. And then we'll um, have someone on our committee will take the lead in making sure that your comments get transmitted back to posts in a kind of organized way. 
um, and that review is probably going to take place April, May. Um, yeah, April, May. So if, if you're interested, please let Allison know that too. Um, and then the last category is AB 846, which is the recently enacted law that incorporates bias screening into recruitment and hiring for policing agencies. Um, POST is currently working with subject matter experts in the anti-bias panel to look at some of the foundation for implementing that. Um, this is not one of the categories that's in RIPA's kind of statutorily defined um, engagements, but we are going to be kind of working alongside with POST and contributing to some of this as it progresses. So um, just to let you know that's one of the things that's happening in that. Um, that's pretty much everything. We're also going to continue just to look into other best hiring practices um, and DOJ is taking the lead in kind of trying to identify um, research that's out there on best practices around hiring to, to exclude bias. Um, okay, thank you. Unless anyone has any questions. I, I have one, Edgar Hampton. I have one. Um, did you guys get, I know I submitted it to uh, uh, the RIPA web, uh, the RIPA administrator for the uh, pre and post uh, job applications, the differences. I know someone had asked if uh, there were any agencies that had already changed their application process to reflect what it would show when you applied to become a police officer. My agency, Anaheim, was one of them. So I sent the pre and the post uh, uh, job application to so that uh, uh, the differences could be looked at. I don't know if that trickled down to you guys yet, as far as the, everyone else in the subcommittee. Oh, this, we have not sent it out to the subcommittee, um, but we can do that um, ahead of okay. the next meeting. Um, and we did receive it at DOJ. Oh, okay. um, and if there are any other law enforcement agencies, um, representatives from law enforcement agencies who want to share that with us as well, that's something that we will be pulling um, the law enforcement agencies on um, as part of our, you know, survey of all of them for the bias-free policing policies. So we will also plan to ask them about how they have adjusted their job descriptions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't thank receive you. like any correspondence back, so I did not. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry no, about no, that. You, you can always email, as Melanie right. said, as right. Melanie said, you can always email me <laughs> um, okay. if you have any questions, and um, I right can on. always get everything to the right people as well. Thank okay, you. yes, thank you. Okay, any additional questions for Member Ochoa? Okay, uh, next subcommittee is calls for service. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kendall Micklethwaite. I'm with the California Department of Justice. Um, this is another subcommittee we're looking for co-chairs on. Um, so if anyone is interested, uh, we are looking for new co-chairs for the Calls for Service subcommittee. Um, Calls for Service really includes two different subject areas, but they're deeply intertwined. Um, that would be bias by proxy, which is a bias-based call for service. Um, as well as mental health calls for service. And so last year we took a look more broadly at mental health calls for service and community-based responses, more of a historical approach and then where the conversation um, is heading. We opened this year um, by uh, a presentation from the San Francisco Street Crisis Response Teams. And so what we're planning on moving forward with this year um, with respect to mental health calls for service is trying to start establishing um, fundamental principles of community-based crisis response. Um, those principles are derived from both what we've learned um, from street crisis response teams as well as other models, as well as, of course, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration um, guidelines and best practices on community-based crisis response. Uh, we'd like to start investigating model policies for agencies when it comes to interacting with folks with a mental health condition. Um, 
and also want to consider lessons learned from these models that we've been taking a look at with a particular lens towards community-based crisis response. Another thing that was raised at the meeting, and it was an excellent point, is um, implementation of community-based crisis response. And so one concern was communities um, taking this on within their budget and also within the, the breadth of their jurisdiction. So, um, for example, um, agencies like Kern County's uh, MET team that covers a large geographic area. So we're going to continue doing more research on that um, and hope to have a report back on how communities have implemented this and particularly looking at actual cost savings that we've seen towards these communities. Bias by proxy is another area we'd like to take a deeper look at. Um, this is a subject area that is crucial when looking at ending um, racial and identity profiling. In 2020, bias by proxy um, became kind of the forefront of this national conversation um, when a bias-based call was made in Central Park against Christian Cooper. But this has been a problem for a very long time. It's been something the board has been discussing for some time now. So this year, we'd like to take a look at dispatcher basic training um, and review or start to begin reviewing individual agencies' policies regarding calls for service. Uh, we also would like to take a look again more broadly at national bias um, by proxy policies and see um, kind of what the political landscape for those are um, since our last report back on that. Um, in last year's report, we started to look at restorative justice approaches to bias-based calls for service. And we'd like to take a deeper look at that this year, looking at bias response teams. And one thing that's been raised by the subcommittee is how, how we take a bias-based call and, and educate the public prior to that call being made, but also after the fact, um, how we provide healing to communities who are harmed from a bias-based call for service. And this last point dovetails into our next subcommittee report, which is kind of that intersection with data. And so we'd really like to take a look at calls for service and bias by proxy and the data we have and see what we can learn from that. Um, and also we'd really like to take a look at uh, disability and calls for service and the outcomes um, that folks have with disabilities and calls for service but also looking at the data in a holistic way. So how that call um, unfolds from the beginning to the end. Um, so those are, are some of the subject areas that we're gonna be covering, it's a lot. Um, so happy to answer any questions, um, but really excited with moving forward on these topics this year and using the data to help inform uh, policy reforms in terms of bias by proxy as well as um, mental health calls for service with kind of that eye for community-based response. So I'll, I'll open it up if folks have any questions. Edgar Hampton again with a question. Hi. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I was wondering, were there going to be any uh, dispatch or dispatch supervisors involved in, in any of the, the committees reaching out and having them on board for input? Because I think that's a huge component into to kind of bridging the gap between the call that the call taker that's dispatching the police officer and then uh, how to, I don't know what's the best word, to translate what their, their, their information they're receiving to, to something that's, you know, closer to what's actually going on. That's an excellent point and actually something that the subcommittee brought up and I failed to bring up in our report back. That is one thing the subcommittee is looking um, to have someone report kind of generally to the subcommittee on dispatcher training, but having someone with lived experience as a dispatcher come and speak to the subcommittee to help kind of inform that experience also the dispatcher and how they kind of the tool set they have in, in dealing with a bias-based call for service. Whether, you know, there are certain agency specific policies and how dispatchers code calls for service. Um, so I think that's an excellent point, and that is certainly something the subcommittee is looking into, having someone with that lived experience come in and help inform that conversation.
There are no other questions. I am not uh, hearing or seeing others. I, I do have one, uh, David Swing. Um, a question about calls for service, and are there other are there other areas that the subcommittee plans to explore related to calls for service, uh, in addition to bias by proxy, um, to look closely at at the data and to, just to evaluate that and provide some perspective on calls for service? That is certainly something we're interested in doing. Um, is looking at the calls for service and seeing if there is more we can learn about uh, bias by proxy and how that's playing into it. Uh, so that's certainly something we want to look into in this subcommittee, but also kind of overlaps with the, the stop data subcommittee as well. Um, but that is certainly something we'd like to look at. And we have this excellent data on it. And so kind of using that data to help inform um, our, our steps moving forward. So yes, that is certainly something we'd like to take a look at something we're working on doing for this year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there are any other questions, I'll be on the line. Great. I do know that board member Raphael, as a co-chair of the board and a co-chair of the sub data analysis subcommittee, is going to provide a report on uh, the next topic. Okay. Thank you, Chief Swing. So, uh, the Stop Data Subcommittee met on, on February 23rd, and we laid out a bunch of priorities for areas that, that we'd like to dig in deeper, and um, uh, areas maybe also to think about ways that we can improve data collection and, uh, and the accuracy of the data. So uh, we, too, discussed in detail calls for service. Several board members suggested we make greater greater effort to test for differential outcomes for stops that our officer initiated versus stops that are are the result of a call for service. Um, you know, the idea being that the public uh, via calls are to a large degree um, governing uh, a lot of the stops that occur, and we should look at this with uh, with greater detail. And I believe I, I can't remember now. The meetings are 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 sort of melding together in my head. But we did have some discussion about dispatching and perhaps uh, training and trying to understand uh, the process of triaging different calls. Um, we had a, a very thorough discussion of consent searches, supervision searches, and queries about parole probation uh, status. Um, uh, some of the issues that were flagged for further investigation included greater detail on the productivity of these searches identifying the appropriate benchmark uh, for the instance of supervisory searches. So she would be using census population versus the composition of local residents on probation or parole, and analyzing the ultimate outcome of stops when uh, consent is sought, but uh, consent is not given. So basically, if people are, are indicating that they, or if it was indicated that they were asked and they said no, uh, where they search for some other reason, trying to understand when that occurs and, uh, and how often it occurs. Um, several board members raised issues about uh, wanting to know more about stops for equipment violations versus moving violations. We discussed more detailed analysis of the degree to which these are disparities in the likelihood of being stopped for um, uh, that are, are basically associated with discretion and perhaps uh, protectural stops. We, we had a very, uh, very good presentation by Anna Rick on the experience of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. Anna presented results from a national survey, transgender and gender nonconforming uh, 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 survey respondents that queried about their experience with law enforcement. She also presented some tabs from uh, our own RIPA data suggesting large disparities in outcomes for these identity groups, and the board expressed, or the subcommittee members expressed enthusiasm for a more focused analysis uh, on this topic area. And then the, the final thing that we discussed to, to some degree is issues surrounding data accuracy and comparability to other sources. So this to some degree is following up on, on board member Ochoa flagging the LA uh, Inspector General report for us and the disparities between what um, body camera footage uh, was showing for stops and what was reported on ripper reforms that was discussed in last year's report. Uh, the, the subcommittee expressed support for further efforts to monitor data quality and perhaps to explore changes in collection strategies and, uh, and the sequencing of questioning to improve accuracy. 
and then perhaps even maybe when there are differences between sort of uh, rip a data stops and stops that are, are recorded through other, other collection mechanisms to try to understand what are the sources of those disparities. And that's it. Mr. Raphael, thank you. I'll turn it over to ask DOJ on the review of the 22 report outline. Uh, it's attached as a, it's one of the attachments in our agenda packet uh, for today and uh, ask DOJ staff to lead us through that uh, conversation. Everything all at once. Um, good morning, everyone. This is Allison Elgar, uh, Deputy Attorney General with the Civil Rights Enforcement Section. Um, so you should all have in your meeting materials, and it's also linked in the chat, um, a copy of the draft um, proposed outline um, for the 2022 report. Um, and really, um, you know, what we did this year was, you know, in the past we've had the full board meeting first. So this year, because we had the subcommittee meetings before this full board meeting, we tried to incorporate what the subcommittees um, had decided to focus on um, into um, the outline. Um, and we also talked to the research center about the analyses that they could do um, on the, the data. Um, since it is now fi finalized as of April 1st. And so um, we really wanted to open it up for the board's discussion on any of the topics you see in that line, any questions you might have um, about, you know, any of the topics, any discussions you'd like to have um, since many of these were based on the subcommittee meetings and the full board is not Everyone's not on every subcommittee, so if you have questions about what other subcommittees are focusing on, um, you know, this is the time to ask. One thing we did a little bit differently um, this year is we created a section um, that's separate from just the stop data analysis itself, um, but is more policy focused data analysis, and so much of the um, data that's presented is, is, you know, has in the past been presented um, with data analysis, um, but the board has really expressed an interest in action-driven reforms and taking that data and um, figuring out how to make recommendations based on what the data is showing us. And so, um, based on some of the topics we talked about in the subcommittee meetings, um, and there are also overlapping topics. Uh, the Stop Data Committee and the Policies and Accountability Committee both discussed, um, you know, the transgender disparities, um, disability, um, you know, overlaps with calls for service and stop data, consent searches, um, searches of people on probation, parole, or supervision. And so um, we created a policy-focused data analysis where we could have certain focused sections um, based on what the subcommittees um, decided to focus on this year. And then those can change each year as we decide to drill down on different topics in addition to the ones that we report on on a regular basis as part of our stop data analysis. Um, so that's a little bit different from years past um, and allows the board some flexibility and ability, you know, ability to dive further into the data and look at them perhaps making recommendations on best practices. And then once there are best practices decided upon, you know, there's the possibility of creating model language or model policies, et cetera. So that is the outline and, and I really open it up for all of your discussion, but all of us are happy to um, help answer any questions or take in any comments. Uh, well, I, I'm looking at the outline now. I just have a one res, one question, maybe, and, and a suggestion on the calls for service um, uh, section under Section C, where it says responding to a mental health crisis. Um, 
you know, I, I was pretty struck in the in the calls for service subcommittee. I believe is where where we heard the presentation by the San Francisco team and the um, the director of emerg of of uh, the Department of um, Emergency Response for the city at at both kind of this idea of you know where we heard from a team on the ground that that was trying something new where they were pairing a, a paramedic with a you know social worker and and somebody who was sort of had a lot of outreach experience with the uh, the population that they were serving but then there was also kind of a higher level management how do we uh, ensure that every call gets respond to? How do you ensure redundancy to make sure that one doesn't fall through the crack and you know a serious incident is is not not responded to? And I, I thought it was just an you know an, an excellent kind of vignette for thinking about the implementation problems associated with um, or just the implementation challenges or things that have to be faced associated with trying to kind of come up with a new model and. You know, I, I see there's the term here, best practices, but I, I don't know if we know what the best practices are yet, because all the localities are experimenting to some degree. But it, I, I imagine it could be instructive and helpful for the state to think about what different localities are doing and, you know, whether they would, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, whether one could could move it from one locality to another. So, for example, what works in San Francisco, which is very dense, might not work in Riverside County, or might not work in in San Bernardino or somewhere else. And a you know a, a more rural part of the state might have a different model. And so, perhaps in you know given that that the research on these different types of interventions is is sort of developing. Maybe what we can do as a board is is provide models that are are being tried and try to think through the elements of a implementation in an urban context and implementation in a less urban context. There questions or or comments about the proposed outline. Um, yes, this is Andrea Guerrero. I have a suggestion. And um, first, I really appreciate the the sections up front on on some of the timely topics of uh, of enforcement during COVID and also the racial justice protests and really digging in on the those issues and differential treatment of, and enforcement. So thank you for that. I think it would be helpful to have at the end of the report a standing uh, section on on recommendations, legislative recommendations that the board is making to the legislature, and also an update on prior recommendations made. So for example, we know that we previously made a recommendation um, to clean up the, the civilian complaint statute uh, and, and clarify it and strengthen it. And there may be other recommendations coming from the board. Um, but we, you know, just to make sure we have a through line on what we've previously recommended, what we're currently recommending and encapsulated in a, in a section that's clear for the legislature to read and, and act on. Other other comments? Melanie, um, I have a few comments. Oh, but first, I want to agree with uh, Andy's suggestion about the through line. I think that was something that was raised in other meetings as well to really kind of track what some of our prior um, suggestions have been made and where those stand currently. I think that's very valuable. Um, so I, I really like the way that that's proposed to being laid out. I love the focused kind of policy investigations into certain areas. I think that's a great idea. Um, just had a couple little comments or suggestions. One of the questions is on the veil of darkness. Um, and I know for last year's report, I thought we, there were questions of whether or not it was gonna be super valuable. 
and but then we said because we had initially um, decided that that was going to be part of it, we want to at least go forward with that for that report. And I just wanted to know if there's a reason why we want to keep it in going forward, if there's a general feeling that it's an effective analysis, or if we want to, if there's other types of things that we think may be more useful to spend that time and energy on. Um, and so another, so that was just one question. Um, one of the questions that I had on the kind of racial and ethnic disparities level is whether or not that would include or could include a more, uh, a greater discussion on kind of the reasons for stops. And I know that was included in, at least in the, the section focused on uh, transgender disparities. Um, but I wanted to know if that could be incorporated into or separately set up for racial and ethnic disparities, because I feel like that's a huge driver here, right? It's uh, the disparities in the types of infractions that are giving rise to these stops. And I wanna just share an anecdote that was shared with me by someone in post when we were looking at some of the trainings and they informed me that someone who was a subject matter expert in law enforcement who was previously sat on this board, um, when they were talking about using the example of jaywalking, that person said, the chief said, um, no one could stop for jaywalking. That's a bad example. Um, and then two black people who were uh, working for posts who were not subject matter experts said they had both been stopped for jaywalking. And I wonder even from before yesterday or before, before this week, how many police officers generally believe that people get stopped for a dangling air freshener. When I personally have a friend who was stopped in California um, for dangling air freshener previously with gun drawn by, by a, a police officer. Um, so this is, I, I really feel that there needs to be more that articulates and demonstrates kind of the vastly different forms of policing that groups experience in a way that is um, kind of both for law enforcement officials as well who don't know, who don't really necessarily even know that that's happening to other people, or maybe they can't even translate kind of the instances that are that they're even engaging in to kind of the broader disparities. And I think that really needs to be laid bare for the public and for law enforcement to be able to address those different things. And because we see so many of, I think that last report really at a high level got to the difference between um, uh, non-moving like technical violations, disparities, and stops. I think if we can get more, maybe go a little bit deeper in terms of um, the severity of this, of stops for different groups and the types of like infraction stops um, that are giving rise to these stops and the difference in the treatment that then kind of um, rolls out of those stops. I think that would be tremendously useful as a point of advising agencies or agencies taking it upon themselves or local advocates taking it upon themselves to push agencies to just stop engaging in certain tactics in much the sense that we're talking about the consent searches. I think stops for minor infractions might be another category of, um, of practice that we want to address because I do think, while I, I concur with earlier statements about the need to address um, how officers are trained to engage in certain conducts. I think whether or not they're engaging in those conducts in the first place needs to be interrogated as well. And I think giving just the data to allow local jurisdictions to then engage in those conversations in a rational and meaningful way is gonna be tremendously helpful. Um, so to the extent we can engage more in that, that would be great. I think that goes into what board member Raphael talked about and engaging in kind of the pretextual stop analysis. And so I'm, I'm not sure if that was already intended to be included in here somewhere. I didn't see not anything that necessarily directly addressed that, um, but I wanted to flag that as something, as a space where I would love to see more deeper analysis. Um, I think those are the main things. Oh, I guess the last thing I guess is something I've raised um, directly with DOJ and concerns that were raised to me that law enforcement agencies may be misgendering individuals who are uh, trans women um, at some in some cases based on this is kind of inferred based on looking at some of the narratives on around stops um, and so I just wanted to know if that's something in the kind of data integrity piece that could be woven into the transgender um, 
focused, policy focused area, just to look at that as well, um, if, if, that's, if that's evident from the data. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions? Member Ochoa, I do, I do know from uh, on the Veil of Darkness that we had a presentation on the Stop Data Subcommittee from folks in Connecticut. And uh, the, the team in Connecticut um, uses the gold standard, or uses the Veil of Darkness methodology as their gold standard in, in evaluating um, uh, potential or evaluating agencies for bias-based policing practices. And so I think that's what, where we landed in the second year is because that is seen as a gold standard by a, uh, a state that has been it has had a a rip a board type program in place for quite some time, and so that's the just as a refresher on that conversation uh, might have been before you're on the board, but just want to let you know about that. Can can I add a comment to flesh that out further? I because I, I feel like. Um, if I were to characterize the presentation that the researchers from Connecticut made, um, that the overall message was that they were using a variety of approaches. That um, so, so, not that it was entirely holistic, but that even though Veil of Darkness was one computational approach they took, that in fact they had a, a, a variety of ways of analyzing stop and search data and so on. and. Um, and that they, there was no one method that they actually said, oh, this is the only one that one should use. And at some point they did use this metaphor of, of gold or silver, but I think it was in the context of which methods were more conservative, that is less likely to flag disparities when in fact there might be, there might, they might be present in policing practices. And so, um, uh, so I don't I don't want us to create the impression that they were advocating only for that for that method and I think it was more complicated and, and in fact that they um, yeah they weren't solely using that method and maybe some for me some of the more powerful take home points were that by analyzing the data and then working directly with law enforcement at different communities and looking at narrower questions and and this is one that um, Board Member Ochoa raised looking at consent searches for example. Um, that they were able to make progress in changing police practice. So I, I just, I, I don't want us to take their presentation as an endorsement of that particular methodology alone. Um, and, I, and in terms of Veil of Darkness specifically and the work RIPA does, I did hear the point made, does implementing that take energy away or time away from other analyses that we should conduct? And so I'd, I'd be interested in hearing more about that so that doesn't become a, somehow a priority when in fact we can see this really rich um, agenda laid out by all of the subcommittees for next steps. Other questions? There was, uh, uh, go ahead. Is there a comment or is that just an echo? I think it was an echo. Sorry. The uh, section on calls for service and bias by proxy, um, I just asked that we, uh, letter B, it looks like responding to bias-based calls for service. Um, that that feels like it's really addressing the, uh, the bias by proxy component. And um, I would just ask that we, um, for future reports, letter D, that we expand that um, to do a truly uh, deeper dive around calls for service and see what our calls for service data look like throughout the state, especially to bring on our wave three and wave four agencies, we'll have a better picture. Um, and, um, and just to have a better, fuller understanding about our, our calls for service data. I think that our prior reports have, have uh, could have strengthened that particular area and uh, just ask that we take a um, a, a closer look at our calls for service data throughout the state. A calls for service piece, is there anything, is this that driven by local policy in terms of what is responded to? Because I for sure have 
know folks that have called the police and been told no one's going to come out for something that is more significant than a lot of things that we've seen police come out for. Um, and so to the extent we're saying, and I heard this when the, in the going through the um, report back from that subcommittee, that this is driven by calls, obviously the bias-based policing, um, no, I'm sorry, bias by proxy. There, there is some mediator there, but in terms of when agencies uh, agencies are being sent out, and I don't know if that's a policy level decision at the either at the agency if you're calling directly to the agency at the um, emergency services if that's who you're contacting, but there there's definitely a distinction. It's not everyone ha everything has to be responded to because people have been told that that's not true, and then some people are told that that is true. So I don't know if the reason that that for that distinction and what people are being told is actually based in policy, or if that's just the individual you just happen to talk to has made that decision on their own discretion, um, or exactly what is driving that, and if there is a distinction across agencies or across jurisdictions in terms of the policies around that, that might be useful to have information on before we say it's driven by calls per se. I think that um... The response is dependent upon the type of call and the severity of the call, and, and you're right, that member showed that the um, level of activity in an agency will drive the calls that are um, uh, that the officers are able to respond to. So I think there are some uh, discrepancies based on either local agency policy or level of activity that, uh, that determine um, calls that officers or deputies respond to. You swing. Can I ask a question, and perhaps also for for other law enforcement professionals? It would be the case that the that the prioritization by dispatch and that triage is that determining who will respond, or do do officers have discretion that I'm going to respond to that? Call, I'm not going to respond to that call. Asking well, the law enforcement partners want to respond to that? Well, I can tell you at the uh, street level, at my level, at the officer sergeant level, um, um, the priority system is is come. Uh, that's a collaboration between the dispatch and then the management uh, of the police management group to determine what's considered a priority one, which would be the highest priority, or a priority five. Um, I can speak for my agency um, and say that. Priorities fours and fives are are basically uh, put into the CAD system, and then the officers can look and see, hey, you know what, I'm close to that. I'll I'll go ahead and handle that. And then when you get to the priorities one, twos, and threes, those are actively dispatched by uh, the dispatch group, the dispatch bureau, to make sure that the officers are responding to those calls. And that's based on the GPS in the cars. Um, and uh, uh, the, the specific types of units that are available to handle those calls. Um, but uh, as far as uh, the officer's discretion, a priority one, two, or three, if you're dispatched to that call, it's, it's uh, and again, I'm only using my agency as an, uh, 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 an example, it's, it's very rare that an officer or even a sergeant would supersede what they were dispatched to because it's usually uh, driven by the location of that particular officer at that particular time. So they're trying to be efficient to reduce that lag time between a call for a call put in and then an officer actually arriving on scene. So um, uh, long-winded answer, I know, sorry, but it, it basically I would say that the priority, the higher the priority or the, the more uh, uh, exigent the call then you're going to have uh, officers responding with very little discretion whatsoever. And I, again, I can only speak on my particular agency, but uh, I can tell you that's uh, that's how it goes in Anaheim. I'll jump in here for a second as well. So I think most agencies, law enforcement agencies, have a set priority system based on the type of call and whether or not it's in progress. 
I mean, when they enter the call in the CAD system, it pretty much assigns a priority to it, especially if it's in progress. Generally, it's a, a priority one if it's in progress. The lower level calls in, in our agency, it's threes and fours. Those calls are dispatched eventually when officers have time or deputies have time to handle those calls. But if somebody calls our dispatch center and requests a deputy sheriff to come to their residence for whatever it might be, a, a welfare check or suspicious circumstances or just because they're concerned about a neighbor, we will respond. Now, it may take a while to get there because it might be a lower priority because it's not in progress, but but we will respond. We don't, we don't uh, not respond because we don't believe it gets to the level that it needs to be. So uh, that decision is made uh, by the management because the dispatcher enters the call for service and the deputy sheriff does respond at, at some point, as I indicated, depending on workload. Some of our stations in the far remote parts of our county, they may not have any calls holding. So if a call like that comes in, they may go right there. Some other places that are a bit busier and not staffed as well, they may have 60 to 70 calls holding at any given time. So they'll get to that call eventually, but it might be several hours, depending on the workload. Coach, you're off the, oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Ray? Yes, I did. Our, our structure is a little different. We are actually more jurisdictional. Um, kind of like uh, Sheriff McMahon would say, that they'll uh, possibly be delayed based on the number of calls and queues that we do. Sounds like there's some hearing. hearing. Audio, yeah. We had a hard time hearing you, Commissioner. It sounds like there may be an audio uh, connection or speaker issue. Better? I'm sure if this is better. Yeah, it's still a little bit muffled. Um, yeah. One of those technical glitches that in the in the new virtual world that uh, that happens. So, um, I know that CHP's response to.